The Wii sold over 100 million units and the future was bright for Nintendo. Surely their follow-up, the Wii U, would perform just as well. Oh, oh no. It sold 13.56 million units, all told, and was discontinued in 2017. But we know how it ended. What about how it started? Which launch games were chosen to give the Wii U the best start in life? When I tweeted that I was working on this video, the replies were a mixed bag of sadness and ridicule, as while the Wii U was and is still viewed as something of a joke by some, those who actually owned the system largely look back on the machine with great fondness. So today we look back at the heady days of November 2012 to examine the European Wii U launch lineup of games. I will of course sort of review them as we go, and we'll go on a little Nintendo adventure together. Are you ready? Then let's do this. Set before, during, and after the American Revolution, Assassin's Creed 3 launched alongside the Wii U just a few short weeks after its other home console counterparts. The game follows Connor, the son of a Native American woman and Englishman who seeks to avenge the burning of his village by Templars searching for an ancient temple. He joins up with the Assassins to do so, and what do you know, his dad's only a big stinky Templar, the order with which the Assassins have been butting heads for millennia. There is of course the modern day stuff sprinkled in there too, but back in 2012, the contemporary mission of Miles and his crew to save the world from the apocalypse was genuinely compelling, with AC3 being the culmination of his story. Gameplay-wise, a number of new features are introduced. Trees can be scampered up, along, and through. Connor comes equipped with a bow and a tomahawk, and in a series first, you can sail boats and fire cannons. There are a few issues, however. As a character, Connor is a bit bland. Charles Lee. He has his motivations, but he doesn't really stand out beyond his admittedly very cool outfit. Additionally, the Wii U release is quite buggy with plenty of pop in, and it takes a good three hours before you actually get to play as adult Assassin Connor, with most of the initial runtime dedicated to Daddy Templar. Regardless, Assassin's Creed 3 performed well with critics, earning an 85% average according to Metacritic. Remember everyone, Batman doesn't kill. GBH aside, something that sticks out about the Wii U's launch lineup is just how many big third-party ports made it in. Yeah, the likes of Call of Duty did come to the Wii, but they were never on par with their home console cousins. Here though, things would be different, and Batman Arkham City Armored Edition was going to prove it by being the same game that released elsewhere a year prior, but with an inconsistent frame rate and, as EGM put it, tacked on gimmicks. Bad beard haver Hugo Strange has been given authority to wall off a portion of Gotham City and turn it into an open-air prison. Troublingly, he also seems to know the true identity of Batman, so in sneaks Bruce to get to the bottom of it all. Arkham City is claustrophobic, impressively detailed, and full of Batman's most dangerous villains. The first game's stellar voice cast are back, and breaking the Bones of the prison's residence has never been more fun either, with enhancements to the iconic free-flow combat system. The Wii U version goes a step further, with the addition of the Bat Mode, wherein Bruce can absorb energy and deal it out in one big go again, not in a murdery kind of way, and Sonar Mode highlights points of interest nearby. The game still reviewed well at 85%, but was down nearly 10% compared to the PS3 and 360 review scores. They say you should never judge a book by its cover, but you know what? I think I will. I think I will judge this bland book by its cover, as Ben 10 Omniverse is exactly the kind of licensed action game you would imagine it to be. Everything about the game feels budget, from the repetitive combat and bland environments to the lack of lip sync or animations on the character models during cutscenes. Ben does have a number of selectable aliens to play as, and each has its own innate Lego game-like abilities, with four arms being able to climb and Cannon Bolt being able to roll and slam into buttons but it does little to shake up the monotony of moving from area to area and alternating light, heavy, and special attacks. Yuri Marvel Spider-Man Lowenthal voices Ben, which is, is cool, I think. Honestly, I'm scrambling for things to say about this game. You can use the gamepad screen to change Alien. The main menu looks like the one from Scooby-Doo in the Cyber Chase. Now I'm tapping out. The combat is mind-numbing, said Games Master UK, with Nintendo Life calling the level design of Ben 10 Omniverse uninspired. 43% according to an average of reviews on Metacritic. 
Call of Duty Black Ops 2 was the highly anticipated follow-up to 2010's Blops, and three distinct modes are available – Campaign, Zombies, and Multiplayer. The single-player narrative continues the story of both Mason – you know, you want the numbers, Mason. that guy – and Woods, with the time period jumping between the 1980s and the far-flung future of… uh, 2025. Time marches on. And death comes for us all, friends. Raul Menendez is a naughty man, first kidnapping Mason in the 80s and then triggering a second Cold War in the mid-20s, and I suppose that someone should stop him, really. The story doesn't quite hit as hard as the original Black Ops, but it innovates with branching storylines, multiple endings, a loadout selection screen before each mission, and digitized Avenged Sevenfold playing a gig on the end credits for some reason. Transit mode is this year's Zombies mode, and I've got to say, it's one of my favourites. Several locations connected by a constantly moving bus adds a real sense of frantic terror as you and your teammates scramble to get back on board before it disappears along its route. Things lurk in the fog, so be careful. Multiplayer is multiplayer, but the servers are still on, and I'm thrilled to report I just about held my own. Across all three modes, however, I found the gamepad cumbersome to use, the button placement felt alien, and the dead zone on the sticks was hard to acclimatise to. A decent enough series entry, Black Ops 2 earned an average of 81%. Releasing a few months later than everywhere else, Darksiders 2 follows on from the conclusion of the first game. The Earth smoulders in ruin and demons roam the land. The person fingered as responsible for all this? War, the fellow you play as in the first game. As his older, far more handsome horseman of the apocalypse brother, Death, it's up to you to undo the end times and prove your brother's innocence. You'll achieve this by travelling across multiple mystical realms on foot or on horseback, undertaking side quests, taking on bosses, platforming all over the shop, and accruing newer, shinier loot and gear. In fact, due to its focus on dungeons and puzzle solving, Darksiders 2 drew many complementary comparisons to The Legend of Zelda. However, I admittedly found the platforming to be a bit tedious at times. From wall jumping to specific jump types, there are an awful lot of finicky controls to memorise, and that proved cumbersome initially. Additionally, while it certainly has a style, it can be a bit… uh… Ugly, at times. Critics largely enjoyed Darksiders 2, though. While many decried the superficial use of the gamepad as a dedicated inventory and map screen, the Wii U version ended up receiving the highest average score on any platform, with 85%. Epic Mickey 2 The Power of 2 is a platformer where you use magical brushes for a variety of delightful hijinks. After being defeated in the first game, the Mad Doctor has had a change of heart, reaching out to Oswald via the medium of song, and, now I've got a plan. I'm not here to conquer Wasteland. and asking for his assistance in solving the issue of a series of earthquakes. Not trusting the Doctor, Mickey is contacted to help things along. While I can't profess to being a big Disney fan myself, and I'm certainly not familiar with the company's golden age, there's something inherently charming to the presentation and unfamiliar character use. A quick Google tells me Oswald was actually Mickey's precursor, and so, to someone, somewhere, the two teaming up in 2012 is a big deal. However, as a game, I found myself more frustrated than not. Your magic paintbrush will paint objects and platforms in and out of existence, and I spent a lot of time spraying the rooms with paint in the hope of spotting some way to progress. The game supports co-op, and Oswald has different abilities to Mickey, but when I was playing in single player, you just follow the AI character around as he solves his puzzles. Furthermore, you're meant to glide with Oswald by grabbing his ankles, but the AI kept hovering just out of reach. I wasn't a fan, and I was not alone in my annoyance, with the average settling on a disappointing 57%. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time! I've played a sports game collection before. It was amazing stepping out onto the field in baseball to see a random lineup of your school friends, or punching the hell out of grandma. And I suppose I've watched a sports game collection too? The Olympics, maybe? Even so, I'm going to give this everything I've got. It seems, to me at least, that many publishers and developers took a big old swing at the gaps in the Wii U's launch lineup that would traditionally be catered to by Nintendo itself. No Mario Party? Here's Rabbids Land. No Mario Kart? Here's Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed. No Wii Sports? Here's ESPN Sports Connection. This game is a bad version of Wii Sports. Tennis, golf, 
golf, baseball, football, karting, and American football are all available, and after making a rubbish not me, you can jump in to the rubbish action. Now, while I wouldn't suggest the offside rule would make football more fun in this instance, its absence is absolutely baffling, as is the fact that the best control scheme they could come up with for tennis was to swipe at the gamepad's touchscreen. Admittedly, you can use Wii Remote as additional inputs, and the controllers are mandatory for some games, but it certainly feels like an inelegant solution. Drifting for boost in the racing game is far too easy, near enough removing all challenge. And to top it all off, the game is really ugly, a barely stylized cartoon abomination that rips off Wii Sports but fails to capture its charm. Also, the AI is crap. Just 31% on Metacritic, with Game Focus calling it sad. Bloody hell, here we go. Family Party 30 Great Games Obstacle Arcade, and I don't want to mince words here, is one of the worst games ever made. How bad is it? Well, it earned an 11% average score according to Metacritic. 11! That's two ones! It also won Official Nintendo Magazine and Screw Attack's Worst Wii U Game Award for 2013, and performed extremely well, or poorly, depending on how you look at it, in our list of the 101 worst games of all time. Go and watch that after this. But why is it so rubbish? Well, firstly, it tries to deafen you when you start it up. Oh my God, what? It then took me far too long to work out how to even begin a playlist of minigames. Turns out, you have to drag a tiny icon onto the desired profile instead of Oh, I don't know, just tapping the options like I had with all previous menus. The character models are hideous, there are truly bizarre minigame inclusions like rolling barrels off the back of a train towards a cowboy, the Wiimote straight up doesn't work in certain games, and The Simpsons' Mr. Black style VO awkwardly inserts player names into generic sentences. Myra, look at you! I could go on, and I didn't get to play as many of the games as I'd have liked, as I was suddenly told I needed a nunchuck to continue, and had no option but to hard quit the game to escape the pop-up. Truly rubbish. Oh yeah, here we go, sports time! I've played a football game before. All of your favourite teams are here. North London, West Midlands Village, London FC, Merseyside Blue, and Manchester United. And I've also watched football. Even so, I'm going to give this everything I've got. It's a football game. It's FIFA. I am running out of ways to analyse FIFA games, guys. Tax fraud aficionado Lionel Messi graces the front cover this time around in a rather subdued port when compared to its 90% average scoring 360 and PS3 counterparts. A few features are missing, but exhibition, career, tournaments and a co-op mode for local multiplayer are all in there. The gamepad shows tactics, the score and team management on the fly, although how you can both play the game on the screen and look down at your lap to change formation at the same time is beyond me, really. Also confusing was the gamepad itself. Now, by this point, I'd played numerous Wii U titles, but the muscle memory of playing FIFA on other platforms simply didn't translate for me here, as the shape of the gamepad and placement of the shoulder buttons caused me to second-guess every move I attempted to make. Apart from some choppiness in the cutscenes, it doesn't look too bad, though, but FIFA God is alive and well in this game, seemingly mandating whether or not you'll make a tackle or kick the ball with appropriate power completely at random. A rather disappointing, but otherwise nice 69% average for FIFA 13 on the Wii U. Old MacDonald had a farm. E -I -E -I. Funky Barn is a farming sim, sort of. I mean, you run a farm, but it has far more in common with every predatory mobile game you've ever avoided than it does Stardew Valley. In fact, I took one look at this game and assumed it was a port of a predatory mobile game, but it doesn't even have that going for it. Am I suggesting that Funky Barn would be more interesting if it was stuffed full of microtransactions? You know what? I think I am. It certainly plays like one, at least, as once you run out of money to spend, you have to twiddle your thumbs and wait until you've earned more. You roam from map to map, placing farm buildings, producing animal products, and hitting certain objectives. You keep your animals happy by fulfilling their needs, you can name them, and you can even stroke their weird faces. Completing tasks gets you access to more animals and buildings, and that's about it. It looks incredibly basic, from its HUD and UI to its very strange Facebook game advert style intro where some kind of inventor slash science genius farmer dies. 
I honestly don't know. Most outlets were shocked that it had a full price tag attached to it, with digital chumps calling the game not satisfying or memorable. 50% on Metacritic. Well, would you get a load of all of these lukewarm boys for? Really brings new meaning to the term, I don't know what to do with my hands. Game Party Champions is another gimmick control field selection of nonsense minigames, but in a bizarre twist, it's one with a story mode. Naturally, I chose Grown Up Sid from Toy Story and was soon greeted by very obnoxious VO from my supposed best friend. Riley? 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 Riley! It's the summer after high school, and before you get on with the rest of your life, your mates come round and is accusing you of being the laziest person he knows. Naturally, to combat that, he signed you up for a tournament at the local arcade where you'll play American football, toss basketballs, and awkwardly swipe at ping pong balls, among other things. I have to applaud the developers for trying something different here, but the exposition stuffed dialogue comes off as incredibly clunky, seeing as your character doesn't actually speak themselves. And hey, you know what? I know it was tough growing up without a dad. That had to have sucked. I had several issues with severe input lag when using the gamepad to play, especially in air hockey, where my puck would lock up and freeze constantly. Rotating the gamepad and combining the tilt functionality with swiping the touchscreen did work quite well in some games, and I enjoyed just how absurd the celebrations were when you won, but largely Game Party Champions is a complete waste of everybody's time. A tragic 24%, according to Metacritic. I don't really need to do this one. I've danced for you all before. After all, remember the PS4 launch games video? I stood there and I waved my arms and according to Just Dance, I was a dancer, a real life dancing queen. And yet, here we are with Just Dance 4, a game that makes use of the Wii U's Wiimote compatibility. I sat at my desk, Wiimote in hand, and waggled it. I didn't dance. Why should I? I proved I could dance before. I wasn't about to put in work here too. And yet, I achieved some kind of score. The game's track list contains everything from contemporary, at the time, hits like Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe, all the way through to weird classics like the B-52's Rock Lobster, and the presentation, as always, is quite striking, with neon professionals prancing about the place. But my long-standing Just Dance issues, such as how you're meant to interpret the vague instructions, persist in this version too. So-called dance quests are available for each song, which are ostensibly challenges, but Just Dance 4 only continues to prove to me that if I can twirl my wrist in a seated position and earn any points at all, you don't need this game to emulate dancing. Just stand in front of your blank TV or a mirror and dance. Just dance. There, I've saved you 40 quid. 66% on Metacritic. After the galaxy-hopping adventures of the first two games, Mass Effect 3 brings the fight to home turf as the Reaper threat becomes a reality and they begin their assault on our special blue marble. Initially under investigation for their Cerberus affiliation in Mass Effect 2, Shepard is swiftly reinstated and thrust into a new role as a galactic unifier, attempting to gather together a Reaper-beating force to see the ancient menace put to bed for good. Your preparedness is tracked via your galactic readiness, and you'll reach the threshold by undertaking missions, recruiting party members, and shooting lots and lots of people right in the face. As the finale of the Shepard trilogy, expectations were sky high and pulling together the intricate threads of decisions made in prior games was vital. Sadly, this, of course, didn't quite pan out. BioWare's maligned ending, which boiled down to three colour-coded choices, was the subject of much outrage, but thankfully the journey to that ending is a great one, with plenty of returning characters, the most refined combat in the series, apart from the previously mentioned slightly wonky Wii U sticks, and a great sense of importance hanging over proceedings. As neither of the previous games appeared on Nintendo consoles, the Wii U version comes packaged with a lovely interactive comic that catches players up on previous plot points and lets them make major decisions. Plus, the multiplayer mode made it across too, although I was sadly unable to find a game to connect to. The Galaxy was saved a decade ago after all. Or destroyed. Or the third option. 85% on Metacritic. Do 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 do! It's a Nintendo console launch, so of course we have to get a Mario game in there, and what a bloody delight New Super Mario Bros. U is. Bowser is up to no good again, with the game opening as his airship attacks Peach's castle, picking up our heroes and yeeting them into a tree containing smiley acorns. <laughs> Man, I spent hours of my life stomping Koopas.
I am bad at Mario. Everything about the game, from its vibrant colours to the incredible music the enemies can't help but dance along to, is pure whimsy. Now get over here, you little blah! It's fun to play too! I was playing it alone, but up to five people can join in using Wii Remote, and the person using the gamepad gets a screen of their very own. There are power-ups, boss fights, plenty of hidden paths and collectibles, and an item shuffling game where you can win power-ups for later use. While it would no doubt provide a more chaotic experience with more players, many critics celebrated its accessibility as a family-friendly title, with Games Master magazine calling it a great excuse for families to gather around the TV and an enticing glimpse of Mario's HD future. A deluxe Nintendo Switch port would eventually release seven years later, scoring slightly lower with critics than the Wii U version, but both versions were highly praised. An 84% average on Metacritic. It's time for yet another minigame collection! This time, however, it's an official Nintendo-developed product stuffed full of their famous brands and IP and presented in polished, cutesy fashion. Taking place within an amusement park setting, your me wanders about the floating Sky Palace to select various games to play. The variety is really quite impressive, to be honest, with the likes of Zelda, Mario, Animal Crossing, Metroid, and Donkey Kong all represented among the 12 included games. You can zip around on a balloon in Balloon Trip, where you swipe the gamepad to control the wind and guide yourself through the courses. You can use the gamepad's gyros to aim your bow in the Legend of Zelda battle quest, and Yoshi's Fruit Cart requires you to draw a path for your dinosaur pal to consume all the treats in his way. Realistically, you'd have been unlikely to spend too long in any one game, or the park in general, but as an official showcase of the Wii U's capabilities, you couldn't really ask for much more, even if that's all the game really did. A 77% average on Metacritic, with Nintendo Life calling it both a wonderful celebration of Nintendo's past and an exciting exciting glimpse into its future. Tragically, with the benefit of hindsight, we all know how that future turned out. Rabbit's Land? More like Rubbish Land! No, I'm joking, but only in the sense that that isn't the game's name. It is absolutely rubbish, though. Rabbit's Land presents a very novel genre, a board game where several players compete in minigames to achieve their goal and finish in first place, and it's Mario Party. This is Mario Party. You roll a die and make your way around a very confusingly designed board, avoiding bad squares and trying to land on good squares with the aim of earning enough trophies to win. Sometimes these trophies are awarded or or subtracted arbitrarily by the board, but the surest way to win them is via the various minigames on offer. These are actually one of the few highlights of Rabbit's Land. The games are creative and varied, making good, albeit gimmicky, use of the gamepad. One had us rolling balls around with the aim of avoiding a bigger ball by tilting the gamepad, and another had us blowing into the microphone to fire penguins at an enemy boat. I don't think I'll ever get used to games asking me to blow into a microphone, though. So unhygienic. You'll be competing against players in all of these, taking on differing roles depending on who lands on the minigame square. Unfortunately, though, everything else. The AI is brutal, the board is needlessly elaborate, and it stars rabbits, so I shouldn't need to go into much more detail there. IGN gave it 5 out of 10 and called it a mediocre party game minigame collection, which is exactly what it is. 52% on Metacritic. Skylanders Giants is a proud, card-carrying member of the Toys to Life genre, where physical figures with little chips inside can interact with video games. In this case, you place your Skylanders onto the USB portal, and just like magic, they appear in-game. The basic premise of Skylanders Giants is thus. The evil Lord Chaos, in an extremely meta twist, has been imprisoned in a toy shop in our universe, and hops onto one of the toy portals to return to the Skylands and cause more problems. The Giants, who originally protected the Skylands, are back and have rejoined the Skylanders to save the world by working their way through generic platformer levels, smashing up scenery and solving basic puzzles. My Skylanders were purchased from eBay and retained their original owner's data, meaning one was wearing a sombrero, another was max level, and the third had a playtime of 15 hours. You can see why this Toys to Life malarkey was incredibly appealing to both kids and Activision, though, as it's chock full of rather manipulative design. For example, certain Skylander elements types will perform better in certain levels and get more XP as a result. So naturally, little Jimmy's going to need a fire Skylander for the fire level, Mum. Come on, cough up. It's quite insidious, really, but the novelty of placing figures on a cool glowing portal is quite fun, and the simplicity of the levels is about right for the target audience. A surprisingly high 80% on Metacritic. 
Sonic and All Stars Racing Transformed is a kart racer, and in the absence of any Mario themed karting, a very welcome addition to the Wii U's launch lineup. To make a very simple premise, quite complicated, Sonic sent a group text to all of his Sega mates asking if they wanted to do donuts in the home base car park after closing. Ashton's favourite racer, ooh la la, <laughs> politely declined, instead suggesting that they undertake the come dine with me of racing. And after someone explained what that meant to the dragon from Panzer Dragoon, they all took turns inviting each other over to race around their respective home courses, and the outcome is really quite wonderful. Seeing the differently themed tracks and races is a genuine delight, with each offering their own unique quirks and impressive levels of detail. But why is it called Racing Transformed? Well, your car will literally transform into various different vehicles when the course calls for it, sailing across bodies of water and soaring through the air. The Wii U version didn't quite score as highly as its contemporary temporaries with some interesting design choices like putting a more detailed map on the gamepad. As with FIFA 13, I don't know how you're meant to look at it mid-race. Regardless, I enjoyed Sonic and All-Stars Racing Transformed an awful lot, and so did critics for the most part, with the review average settling on 78%. We have a launch games first here, ladies and gentlemen, as I regret to inform you that I have not played Tank Tank Tank. I tried, truly, I did, but emulation proved fruitless, this is as far as I could get, and when I looked into purchasing a physical copy, I did a little sick in my mouth. But why is it so elusive, and why is it so expensive? Well, it's a combination of there not being a huge quantity of physical copies printed, the game then going free to play, and the game servers then being turned off before ultimately being delisted from the eShop. These factors combined have made Tank 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 a very difficult game to play in 2023 and a massive headache for both archivists and those invested in video game preservation. But enough about that, here's what the game's about. Tank 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 was originally a Namco Bandai Games arcade cabinet that released in Japan in 2009. You drive a tank around, shooting at big old monsties in a manner that, on the surface, appears to borrow many elements from Earth Defense Force. And it was popular, and reviewed very well. But when it was ported to the Wii U, reviews were far less glowing, landing on 45% according to Metacritic. Critics bemoaned the game's limited modes and content, with others taking aim at everything from the controls to replay value and enemy variety. Maybe not the end of the world we missed out then. The world's greatest fighters have once again gathered to leather one another. In Tekken Tag Tournament 2 Wii U Edition, as the name implies, you can team up with a fellow Tekken-er to unleash physical devastation on your opponents, and the opening cutscene, as always, is very good. Big fan of an actual demon in the back of a taxi, and good god, just look at these mother flippers go! Choosing a partner has never been more of a challenge, as TTT2WUE featured the largest Tekken roster to date, with over 50 fighters. And yes, all of the varieties of animals are there. The bear, the panda, the jaguar, man, the kangaroo, Alex, the dinosaur. One of the many things I love about Tekken is how I can apply my basic skill set and knowledge and always do at least okay. I wouldn't call what I do button mashing, but rather creative input inference, and it delivers results at least half of the time. Without a doubt, one of the best things about the Wii U version is the inclusion of the Nintendo-themed costumes, so if you wanted to watch Jin kick a man in the face while dressed as Link, or Alex the Dinosaur kick that same man in the face while dressed as Bowser, then this is clearly the definitive version. Gamepad-wise, combo are displayed during fights, although again, not sure how you're meant to sneak a mid-fight peak, but Tekken Tag Tournament 2 Wii U Edition was received well by critics, achieving 83% on Metacritic. Transformers Prime The Game is a brawler based on the animated series of the same name. While I'm not the biggest Transformers fan myself, this game reeks of tie-in video game with its strange CG art style and unwanted presence of pre-teens, so at the very least I'm glad my suspicions were confirmed. It opens with the Autobahns thwarting the evil Dexahesimals as they attempt to harness a meteor comprised of pure dark energon. The resulting eruption causes the Otter Thoughts to be separated, with Megan the Stallion ordering his Dodecahedrons to hunt them down. The Transformers have a ranged weapon combos, a shield, 
shield and can turn into their vehicle form at will, but ultimately bland fight after bland fight in bland environment after bland environment awaits you here. The game does try to make things interesting with a special powerful attack being triggered by filling a bar like Optimus Prime's energy axe, but again, there's only a handful of times you can do this before it gets old. You fight some enemies, walk forwards to trigger a cutscene, then you do the same thing again. The voice acting's solid, however, with Optimus and Megatron actors Peter Cullen and Frank Welker reprising their roles, and that might be enough for fans of the show and, you know, the kids this game is intended for. Not for me, though. No thanks. 56% on Metacritic. Not even Hospital Lime's signature catchphrase could redeem this one. Autobots, are you ready? A combination of the Dynasty Warriors and Samurai Warriors franchises, Warriors Orochi 3 Hyper is an enhanced port of the 2011 PS3 and Xbox 360 original. Simply by hearing the name of its parents, you know how this game plays. You'll traipse around a big map, killing named foes, switching between your three characters, and hitting waves of enemies in an attempt to turn the tide of battle. This time around, however, the setting is a bit more fantastical, with a giant hydra towering out of a lava lake in the middle of the map. Additionally, this Wii U version features a number of nice bonuses, including a new multiplayer dual mode, additional playable characters, and the ability for local co-op players to have one person use the TV and the other use the gamepad as their screen. That's all well and good, but sadly these bells and whistles do little to enhance a middling hack and slash with a 64% review average. I personally found myself hopelessly lost, wandering around the Hydra like a depraved Mayday enthusiast. I fired the ballistas at the giant beast, I killed hundreds of fathers, sons, and brothers, and when all seemed to be lost, the game didn't even have the decency to allow me to hurl myself into the lava pit. What a shame. It's time to be enthusiastic about exercise, guys! Okay? Just look how excitable all of these beautiful people in peak physical condition are. It's like they're paid to be there. You begin Your Shape Fitness Evolved 2013 by inputting your weight, height, and other bits of info. You also have to take a photo, which is when the Wii U took the opportunity to murder my visage by capturing me mid-blink and duplicating my forehead. Cheers. The game itself provides access to activities, workouts, recipes, and more, with the ability to set goals and earn coins and medals as you play. Speaking of play, just how does this Ubisoft-developed title expect to get you to lose weight? Well, by copying and pasting Just Dance's mechanics and removing all of the colour, of course. I started by dancing along to Born This Way by Lady Gaga while Poundland Taylor Swift emotionlessly flailed her limbs. Naturally, I sat at my desk and emotionlessly flailed the Wiimote, apparently burning 15 calories in the process, which is roughly equivalent to two large strawberries. Great. I then attempted a crumpin' exam because I needed to know what a crumpin' exam was, and boy, I'm glad I did. The narrator really immersed me in the workout here, coming out with such classics as Get it on with the rolling up and down. And of course, Show some rhythm with the funky Charleston. This game is absolutely unhinged and I am done. Your Shape Fitness Evolved 2013 is essentially slow just dance but with a calendar and calculator built in and it got 76% according to Metacritic. For many, Zombie U looked to be amongst the most promising titles to kick off the generation of U. Developed by Ubisoft, this first-person survival horror title took place in a zombie ravage to London, with your survivor guided through the wasted capital by a mysterious man called The Prepper. With a focus on the London underground and avoiding time on the surface where possible, the game is packed with interesting ideas that aim to keep you immersed. Torch batteries need to be scavenged and replaced, but attract the undead when they're in use. Your radar can ping nearby enemies, you'll sleep and customise your gear in the safe house before heading out on missions. It's a solitary experience, and the game is so bloody dark at all times that scanning the darkness for movement can be extremely unnerving. Unfortunately, a lot of the game's good work is undone by gimmicky controls. Beyond showing HUD and a simple map on the gamepad, you'll be managing your inventory on the fly but have to do so with touch controls, meaning that every time you loot something you'll be staring down at the device in your hands and dragging items around with your finger. Additionally, when I used a turret, the first-person view was displayed on the gamepad and I had to tilt the pad to aim. While I applaud the creativity, a lot of the time it just served to slow proceedings down. Good ideas and mixed execution is Zombie U's grisly fate. Personally, I'd like to see it return one day, but with a review average of 77%, who knows if we ever will. And that 77% brings the total average score of the Wii U's launch lineup to 64.3%. 
And there we have it, every Wii U launch game sort of reviewed in 2023. Was there one among them that was your favourite? Do you think Zombie U should get a second chance at life? I realise that that's uh, ironic given that it's about zombies, but let me know. I'd, I'd like to know. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, why not share it around the internet? Why not follow me on Twitter? Why not subscribe to the channel? A very happy new year to all of you. I wish you all the happiness and success, and thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye!